This is the Goat Bakr Government Girls Primary School in a village near the bustling city of Lahore, Pakistan. This school is a central part of this film because it is where our journey began. <laughs> My name is Miriam and my name is Naval. We're twin activists, journalists, and filmmakers based in Toronto, Canada. We're originally from Pakistan and were born and raised there until we were five years old before moving to Canada. We go back to Pakistan often and after we finished high school a semester early, we went back to Pakistan to explore the status of girls' education there. Here's what we discovered. <laughs> Our grandmother actually donated some of her land to have this school built and we visited the school for the first time when we were eight years old and we've been connected to the school ever since. We were very excited to meet the girls at the school and we learned that they were going to quit school when they reached grade five because they would have to work to support their families. One of the places where many of the girls worked was the local carpet making factory. We visited the girls and asked them about their work and one of the things that we found was that their work did not require them to be educated and girls that were really young could be doing this work as well because they used different codes and thread colors to be able to make the carpets. While the working conditions were not ideal and the girls had to sit down for hours on end working on a single carpet, they were happy that they were able to find some sort of income to support their families. This shocked us and we knew that we had to do something. We told them that educating themselves would be able to get them better jobs that would in the long term help them support their families even more because they would have better income and also better working conditions. And over the next five years, during our family trips to Pakistan, we did all that we could to convince the girls to continue their education. We held empowerment workshops and spoke to their parents, which was not an easy task all the time, especially at first, because often our efforts were not taken seriously. We were the same age as the girls, and many times the adults would brush us away. But eventually they started to listen, and we would have discussions on the importance of education and what that would mean for their families. And education is vital in breaking the cycle of poverty that many of these families found themselves in. They had to think about how to put food on their tables that day. Not recognizing the long-term benefit of educating their daughters made them decide to send them to work. We had resolved to fix this issue and persistently discuss the benefits of an education with the parents and their girls. In 2015, during our trip to Pakistan then, we learned that some of these girls were actually going to high school. It was the first time in our activism journey that we realized our actions could have an impact. Four years after our last trip to Pakistan, we returned there in 2019. One of the first things that we did was go to our village and hold workshops with the kids there. We started our workshops with everyone at the school, and there are over 100 children there now. Um, it's a girls' school, but a few young boys attend too instead of going to the boys' school. So we got ourselves introduced to them, and there were kids that we knew from before, and there, was also, there were also new kids who we had never met before. And so we got ourselves introduced and played some ice-breaking games, and everyone really enjoyed themselves. Then we focused our efforts to a smaller group of girls who were older and more mature. So the idea was that we would work with these girls and, and they would pass on the things that they were learning to the younger children. The topics ranged from environmental stewardship to safety and you know, violence prevention, 
We had worked on workshops that were especially designed to address this issue. We were also discussing the importance of their education and talking to these girls about their dreams and aspirations and what they could do to help them reach the, these goals. We had a wonderful time working with these girls. They were very excited and ready to learn always. We also had lots of fun playing games with them. It was just a wonderful opportunity that we had to be able to connect with these girls after all of these years that we had spent away because the last time we came to Pakistan was in 2015 and this year in 2019 we were just super excited to be able to work with them again and it was a great time that we had and we're um, really happy to be able to share their stories and we'll get you introduced to them. किस क्लास में हो? थ्री, फोर क्लास, फोर क्लास में, थ्री क्लास, थ्री, टू क्लास, फोर, टू, टू, टू क्लास में। सबसे अच्छी बात क्या लगती है स्कूल की? पढ़ना चाहिए, बड़े हो कर कोई जॉब मिल जाए, किसी ने टीचर बनना हो, किसी ने डॉक्टर बनना हो, किसी ने पायलट बनना हो, इस तरह की चीजें। उसके लिए स्कूल जाना ज पढ़ने के लिए क्या अच्छा लगता है पढ़ने के लिए बच्चों को स्कूल क्यों जाना चाहिए तालीम हासिल करने के लिए कोई जाता है तालीम हासिल करना बड़े होकर फौज फौज भी जा सकते हैं पुलिस टीचर डॉक्टर वकील तालीम हासिल करना और दूसरों को भी सिखाना मुझे इसलिए स्कूल जाना अच्छा लगता है क्योंकि हम बड़े होकर दूसरों को भी स्कूल जाना सिखा सकेंगे We spoke the other day about why you should study and why an education is good for you. We're really happy that all of you are studying and we want you all to continue until you reach the highest level. You can become rich, but that can go away. Everything can be taken away from you, but your education is something that is in your own mind, so no one can take that away from you. This is something that makes you strong, meaning that when you are more educated, you become a stronger and more independent person. Now, it's not only important to continue your education, but also to give back to your community. One of the ways that you can do that is through planting trees and being good to your environment. You know what we're going to do today? Today we're going to take some plants that we have brought and we're going to plant them outside. Do <laughs> 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 Okay, <laughs> 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 Whenever the two of us read stories about children being the victims of violence and abuse around the world, we were filled with grief and we felt that we couldn't do anything about it. In 2018, however, we decided to create a toolkit that teachers could use around the world to tell children about protecting themselves from different kinds of abuse. The first place where we implemented this toolkit was with the girls in our village in Pakistan. Here are a few parts from our workshops. 
only you can decide who is allowed to touch you. This is a serious thing, kids. You never know. Some people may seem good, some people may seem bad, but no one is allowed to touch you, no matter what happens. Some people's minds are just weird, or their intentions are bad. Let's say that you're a little girl, and you're the guest, okay? You come into the house, and I'm her mom, okay? So come into our house now, hello, welcome, how are you? Come on, child, greet the guests, you're supposed to greet the guests. Okay, so now that you've met in front of the mom, that's okay, it's okay to meet guests in front of the mom. Now imagine the mom leaves, she goes into the kitchen, and now look what happens. Come here, child. Leave me alone, I don't know you. Scream. The mom still doesn't know what's happening. You haven't told her properly. Scream loudly. Okay, so now the mom heard you. What happened, child? So before we were talking about how a guest comes and tries to touch you, this is something that obviously seems very weird, but sometimes your relatives can also do something weird. Now, n never think that you are protected even from your relatives. It's not that you should start getting scared of everyone, but you should just be careful. Yeah, be careful. If a relative, for example, your uncles, your all of these are relations of love because you love all of them. You love your cousins too and they're like your brothers. However, if one of them tries to do something weird, for example, let's say you're a little girl and you're her cousin, okay? Come here. You're a boy cousin and you're her uncle, okay? You come too. Come here. Yeah. So now you guys meet all the time and let's say I'm the mom. I'm going, okay? If one of these two tries to do something that makes you feel uncomfortable or makes you think this is not right or makes you think now that my mom is gone and this person is trying to do something weird, you have to scream then too. You have to make noise, kids. Make noise. Yeah, the main point is noise. Yeah. Because in this moment, you don't know what else to do. It's not like everyone is evil or anything, but there are just some people who, and, and there are some moments when people do bad things because evil thoughts come into their hearts or whatever the reason may be you just have to worry about yourself if anyone tries to touch you or tries to hurt you or touch you in any way that you're not comfortable with you're just gonna shout and you're gonna scream and you raise your voice and you can say this can't happen because you and your whole body belong to you only and no one can do anything to it that you don't want them to because people are going to, if God forbid anything happens that's wrong, people are going to think, oh, she's just a little girl, I can do anything to her. But you are all really strong, you're educated, and you're going to go really, really far, and you're not going to become weak in front of anyone because you're all very strong and very resilient. Okay, so now everyone stand up and spread out. So now we're going to do something called power posing. Do you know what poses are? It's like when you smile or pose in front of the camera. So this is called power posing. We're going to do this right now. So you feel really strong and you feel really good. You're going to feel that freedom too once you do these. Okay, so now let's do it again. One, two, three. Okay, so what is acceptable? For example, when a mom and a kid hug each other, what kind of touches are acceptable? When your mom hugs you, it's all right. What are some other examples of acceptable touches? When your dad or your sister touches you, the doctor too, yeah, the doctor, but only when your parents are with you. Even then, only you can decide who is allowed to touch you. What is unacceptable? When a stranger tries to touch you. Yes, when a stranger tries to touch you. And if your mom is not with you in the room, or if a stranger stops you and finds your path, what are you going to do? Scream. Yeah. We also talked about something else. What was that? Show us how you do it. So we're going to do it like this. One more time. Being able to work through the Shine Toolkit with these girls was such an empowering experience. By the end of the workshops, the girls were opening up and becoming more confident, and as much as we were trying to teach the girls, there were so much we learned from them too. They even showed us some new games, and under their leadership, we played different versions of them, and it was amazing to grow our bond with these incredible young girls. Throughout our trip, we came back to our village, did workshops with the kids there, and learned more about their path to getting an education. Every single story was one that showed mothers breaking barriers and ensuring that their kids went to school, and also a lot of children who were dedicated and passionate about their education. When this journey began 10 years ago, we saw a school 
some students who are ready to quit their education, and one teacher. Now, we still see a school, but with 100 students who are ambitious and don't plan on quitting school anytime soon, and four dedicated teachers. One story that stood out was that of a single mother, Safia, and her two daughters, Mariam and Rabia, who we have known since they were very young. They are currently the oldest girls in the school because they cannot afford to commute to the high school in their village, and the teachers are helping them continue their studies at their primary school. Their mother has had to work harder than most others in the village to get her girls to go to school, but that hasn't stopped her from making sure that happens. We spoke to Safia and her daughters to hear more of their story. मैं कुड़िया स्कूल इस तू गल के मैं जिद मेरा घर खराब हो मेनू ना बड़ी मुश्किल बन गई अपने मतलब बच्चा पालन की तो मैं बच्चों ने इस तू स्कूल गल के बच्चे पढ़ सन दे पढ़ के तो कोई ना अपना सर्कट चला ले सन दे इस वास्ते कि मैनू किसी की सपोर्ट भी कोई ना आई और किसी की इजाजत भी कोई ना आई और इस पिंड ने इन्ना को खास रिवाज भी नहीं कि बच्चों को पढ़ाया जाए बच्चिया खास तौर पर इतनी अहमियत भी नहीं देंगे तो मैं सारे घर वाल तो भी मतलब बद के अपन बेटिया को पढ़ाया इन शाला मेरिया बच्चिया भी जड़िया ने लैक भी हैं और पढ़ना भी चाहिए ने मेरा भी दिल है उन्होंने भी दिल है कि असी पढ़िए और पिंड वाले बड़े ज़्यादा गल् करते हैं पर मैं कोई किसी की परवाह नहीं मेरिया बच्चिया और लैक भी हो पढ़न भी तो अपना कोई आने वाले वक्त वास्ते मुस्तकबिल बना लैन ठीक है तो मरिया मुराबिया कभी मुश्किलात उन्होंने की होंगी है कि पढ़ाई के किसी और स्कूल जाने स्कूल जाने कोई और मुश्किल उन्होंने की होंगी है उन्होंने मुश्किल तो होंगी है कोई कोई है भी जी चीज़ नहीं कि जिंद गड्डिया भी नहीं साढ़े को और जाने मुश्किल भी होंगी कोई उन्होंने छ्डन वाला भी नहीं अपनी हिम्मत तो पढ़द पे बड़ी मुश्किल न तो कोई आस पास ना उन्होंने कोई नहीं बेनाल दिया बच्चिया भी नहीं कलिया ही जाए हाँ तो ये उन्होंने हिम्मत है कि असी कलिया भी जाइए तो असी पढ़ना है तो मैं भी कोई फर्क नहीं पाता कोई गल् करे ना करे तो मेरा भी दिल है कि पढ़ जा पिंड भी रिवाज हों कि छोटी उम्र बेटिया ना शादी करवा लेंगे तो थोड़ा की ख्याल है इस मामले के बच्चों शादी जल्दी करवा देनी चाहिए दे, चाहिए है या फिर उन्होंने पढ़ पढ़न देना चाहिए मेरा ख्याल है कि बच्चिया पढ़न देना चाहिए वो पढ़न अपनी मर्जी न कोई नौकरी कर जो भी उन्होंने मतलब दिल हो उस तो बाद आराम नाल शादी करा कि मेरा कोई मसला नहीं कि मैं जल्दी शादी करा ठीक मैं पसंद नहीं गल थोड़ी फैमिली दे और कोई है बच्चिया या कुड़िया जिन्ना पढ़ा पहले नहीं ये मेरी बच्चिया पहले हैं जड़िया पढ़दी पाशाला कोई और लोग गाँव के 
जे असी सारे दिल करें कि बाकी सारे जो भी सोच थोड़े वाकन होए कि बाकी सारे भी समझने के बच्चे उन्हें पढ़ाना चाहिए था असी क्यों में उन्हें दी सोच बदल सकते हैं उन्हें उदासना चाहिए था कि वे खुद थोड़े सामने की मिसाल है कि उन उन कोई होर है भी नहीं स्पोर्ट भी नहीं थे वो बच्चियां न पढ़ाने दी पीए तुष्य भी उन देलो वे के अपनी यह बच्चियां न पढ़ाओ अपनी यह बच्चियां दा बच्चियां दा मुस्तक बिल सोचो कि उन आवास के बेहतर हो जाए Another place where we spent a lot of our time during our trip was Lahore. This city has been around for centuries, and many of the iconic pieces of architecture that are still around today, like the Badshah Mosque, were built in the Mughal times. The landscapes and culture can change so quickly in Pakistan. When you look at this diverse and busy place, it's kind of hard to believe that it's only about an hour away from our quiet, sparsely populated village. Lahore is rich with culture, history, and is the second most populated city in all of Pakistan. We had a wonderful time exploring all the incredible places in the city, visiting bazaars, and trying out local food. We also interviewed several individuals from various industries during our time in this city. Regarding their thoughts on girls' education, in a report titled "Shall I Feed My Daughter or Educate Her?" released in 2018, Human Rights Watch explains that 32% of primary school girls in Pakistan are out of school, compared to 21% of boys. By the time students reach grade six, 49% of boys are out of school, compared to 59% of girls. Furthermore, only 13% of girls remain in school by ninth grade. To learn more about this, we conducted our first interview with Ali Zafar, who is a Pakistani singer, songwriter, model, actor, producer, and painter. He has done a lot of work for different social causes, like the Shokat Khanum Memorial Cancer Hospital, and supported different girls' education initiatives through the Ali Zafar Foundation. We spoke to him about how he's tackling the issue of girls' education. What inspired you to take action for girls' education? Was it a specific moment, um, an incident that you saw, or just a c accumulation of different things? It came from my childhood because my mother. I used to see my mother go to a university, the Punjab University. Uh, she was a librarian first, and she was so persistent in her education and studies, and my father was so supportive of it that that really set an example for me. And I remember watching her. Get out and travel all the way because we didn't have a car or a bike or anything. So she used to travel in in public transports, which are very they're filled with like wagons and vans. So you have if you've ever traveled in them, I mean, it, it, men are on top of each other and there's space for two women in in the front seat. And so she's she's gone through that entire drill, and I've seen her become Pakistan's first. Um, woman who is a postdoc scholar in bio sciences. So that's what really I think struck to me that you know we in our society need to empower our women and their education because one woman when she is educated and and enlightened she is now educating the whole family right a set of children and the the impact is a lot more than a man yeah. and that is why I feel that a woman is such a strong. Institution in ourselves, 
that she can make such a big difference. So, uh, as a philanthropist and humanitarian, you have supported many different causes, including girls' education. So, as you worked for this cause, uh, what were some of the major barriers you saw that girls or children in general faced when going to school? I think with with girls over here, primarily, there's a mindset that's indoctrinated, which is that girls are eventually going to get married one day, have babies, and that is their real job and work that's going to be now. There's, I think that's that's a beautiful thing to get married and have children and have a family and to nurture and raise children. But women and girls, they're a lot more than that. And the potential is a lot more than that. And they're not just there or born to serve men. They have their own dreams and wishes and they should be allowed to dream as men do. They should be allowed to choose for themselves as men do. Uh, they should be allowed to have the lives that they want for themselves. Whatever influences God has granted me with, uh, over people with my voice, I think it's important to raise that voice that we as men in general need to be even more compassionate towards women and care. Uh, can you please tell us a bit about your current girls education projects? Yes, we are at the moment, um, uh, we are rehabilitating the uh, sex workers in the uh, in an area in Lahore. So we are rehabilitating them and their children and their families and educating them and inspiring them to educate their children so that they don't go in the same line of work. And uh, there's a school uh, called Learning Hub that we are supporting and we plan to make more learning hubs where um, not just those women but women and people and children who come from a background where uh, and that could, that includes uh, uh, you know transgenders and other people who are mostly rejected and dejected by the society uh, and they're probably shamed and embarrassed of their existence sometimes uh, but they're also human beings so I think we really need to take care of them also. One of the most beautiful places in all of Lahore is the interior of the city. We remember visiting the Lahore Fort, the Badshai Mosque, and other iconic places ever since we were children. And yet, beyond the tall, gorgeous walls of this ancient city, there was a social issue that we had never been aware of. There is a red light district nearby, and the children who lived there were being neglected by the rest of society. Many of them did not have access to an education. Now, we always knew that access to an education is a major issue in Pakistan, but because there are different regions with different issues, we did not know all of the reasons for this. Being neglected was one of the reasons why many of the children in this particular area of interior Lahore did not go to school. However, in March 2018, a community uplifting initiative was launched to educate these children. This was called the Learning Hub. And the school that was started by this project is the same school that the Ali Zafar Foundation is one of the sponsors for. The three founding partners for this project were Akhuwat, the Punjab AIDS Control Program, and the Wall City Authority. We sat down with Zarka Tahir, the founder of the Learning Hub, and others like it, to learn more. Now, what happens is that there are multiple reasons why these children, girls and boys, don't go to school. One of them is just the neglect, because uh, no one feels that it's important to really educate them. Other reason is that most of them have a lifestyle where uh, the families, they stay up during the night. Mm -hmm. So most of our schools, the public schools, are to have morning. A few of them have started uh, afternoon shifts, but most of them are in the morning. Yeah. So there's no way that these women are going to send their children to school at 8 in the morning or 7 in the morning. That is another reason. One of the other reasons was that many of the schools ask for birth documents. And these children do not have birth documents. The first place we went to was the Shahi Mohalla, uh, which is the red light area it's, it's since the Mughal times. It's it's been there, but as you know, with with, with the passing of time, uh, the traditional culture of the Shahi Mohalla died down, and um, 
it was replaced by uh, the system of brothels and uh, even the trafficking of girls and it was no longer where it was only a dancing profession. It moved into prostitution. Um, and the differentiation between a dancer and a prostitute was no longer there. Also what happened was that because of modern technology where you have an entire system, you don't need the traditional tabla wala, you don't need all those people. So the whole culture and, and everything died down. And then there were uh, regimes who did a crackdown on prostitution without giving them an alternate lifestyle. So both these families, the musicians' families and the the families of the prostitutes, they did not know what to do except move totally into prostitution or you know, just live below poverty line, just scrap out a living. Many of these families then moved to the place that we are at. It's called Bhagavad Munshi Lata, and it's right opposite Taksali, opposite the traditional Shahi Mahalla. And this was also called, that is called the Hira Mandi, and this was this began to be called as the Mini Hira Mandi. It does not take just a school. It takes a community to raise a child. So we stopped working just for the children and their education. We moved into the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. A school can do just that much. It's not just the parents, it's the parents, it's the teachers, it's the community members, it's the government. We need a collaboration of everyone because the problem is huge. So what we did was that we opened up a learning hub, which was education. Seeing that uh, that was not enough, we started uh, with a craft hub, started teaching them a skill. Uh, again, just having them get an education is not enough. Mm -hmm. We need to teach them a skill. This is basically a totally community uplift project mm -hmm. where the community takes ownership. We interfere to the minimum possible level. We ask for their advice for everything at all because it's their children, it's their, it's their people around them. So uh, we, they, they said that stitching is what they wanted. We started with stitching. Um, then they thought you know, they wanted cooking was also a strong point. So we've started a community kitchen here. It's, it's being uh, done up. So what happens now is that uh, these kids from this entire community, which is of dancers, uh, musicians, um, and all the, all the street children as well, because it is not just uh, families and children of dancers and musicians who are at risk, but the other kids who are going around, they are at risk too. Mm -hmm. So when people ask me, what do you do here? What, what's, what, what are you achieving? Because you know, there's so many kids out there. I tell them, you know, right now, we're giving them six hours of childhood per day, six days a week. Yes. That is what we're doing. We're creating memories. If I tell you to close your eyes and think of your best memories, even if I ask you, all of you, you will think of things where you did as a child. Yes. So they, they come up with such horrible memories. What we say is that we cannot erase them. Mm -hmm. All of them, we can work towards them because we have a, a, a psychological program or a social program as well. But what we can do is that we can pile them up with so many good memories. Um, that the human brain will recall just the happy incidents that they have had. The other thing about the curriculum that makes it uh, special is that uh, with the help of uh, some uh, psychologists and a couple of psychiatrists uh, from a fountain house, they have developed a five-year plan, which on the surface of it may just be uh, random activities, but every activity has a purpose. and. The purpose is to actually make them adjust as as humans, as citizens in the world, because uh, this is this is not a normal world with normal relationships. Um, this is a strange world with surreal relationships, mm -hmm. uh, and so they are going to live with the taboo. Many of them yeah. uh, so that they have to overcome it. They have to adjust in the society. The society has to adjust to them. So that is a very important part of our curriculum, which is a five-year plan, uh, complete with intervention strategies. That is being monitored by psychologists. The whole street is going to have a new look, and uh, it is going to be a street that is safe for children. There, there, was, there was a parent who said, I can't recognize my own children. This just started last March. It's yes. been a year. Wow. And these children were on the street. 
using very abusive language and not really caring for anything, you will see them now. Mm -hmm. And even I can't believe the change. When the kids come up and speak, they're polite, they pick up litter, they have changed overnight. It takes so much to change an adult human being. It takes mm -hmm. so little uh, to change these kids. If on the negative side, someone can turn a little mind into blowing up, why can't all of us together turn these little minds into being good humanitarians? The concentration is so much on prostitution that we forget what I called the red light areas collateral damage. And that is the children. That is where our concentration should be. These two women left prostitution only because of one reason. They did not want the same life for their children. Yeah. Their children was the single most, not lectures, not, not awareness drives, but their children was the most motivating force. When they saw that there was an opportunity for their girls to study and not be involved in any other activity, they went for it. Mm -hmm. There is a tailor out there. And the tailor said, said that I have stitched clothes for dance performances of these women. And today I stitch their kids' uniforms. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a tremendous thing to achieve. All in all, this is just a place where you're supposed to be happy. Yeah. Forget about everything else. While a lot of children are out of school in Pakistan, there are also those who do get to go to school, but their performance in school is negatively impacted due to their families. Specifically, the addiction of a parent to drugs has a negative impact on a child's mental health, their well-being, and in turn, their performance in school. To find out more about this issue and how it can affect children, we interviewed Dr. Sadaqat Ali, who is a Pakistani addiction psychiatrist, motivational speaker, author, and TV celebrity. He was one of the first people to start addiction counseling and drug rehab in Pakistan. For this reason, he has a very unique perspective in the healthcare industry and the impact of drugs within families in Pakistan. He's also the founder of Willing Ways, which is an addiction treatment center which provides psychiatric and rehabilitation services to people. So are there um, specific projects that Willing Ways is running that, um, that deals with people of like different classes and specifically the, like the impoverished population, whether that be younger people or even older, um, but specifically for impoverished um, people? Uh, we have awareness project by the name of Willing Ways again. It is uh, live streaming uh, that happens daily 
on Facebook and uh, our professionals uh, create awareness in all sectors of the society. Uh, mostly, uh, we talk about preventive measures as to how can the family members or the parents take care of the children in a fashion so that they are not inclined to use drugs to begin with. We have always considered that the education of girls is a cause that is linked with the development and economic growth of countries. So why do you believe that educating girls um, will improve Pakistan in the future? Empowerment of women in the right sense is the solution to all of this. Education is good. It can help women get good jobs. But the real thing is motivating women and educating men who have a habit of creating hurdles in the way of women mostly fathers, brothers, and husband too. And when women work, it is made difficult for them to do so. So um, at Willing Ways, you recognize that an individual's addiction uh, can negatively impact the whole family. And your work supports families who are suffering with family members who have um, addiction problems. So can you tell us about the impact um, specifically that like a parent's addiction can have on children and their um, what their work at school or their performance at school? Definitely. If even one of the parents is addicted to alcohol or drugs, the children are badly affected by that. They become codependent. They, they become snubbed in their life. They hush up. They do not open up to other people. Mm -hmm. And they have a kind of suffocating, lonely life. Mm -hmm. So it is very important that when somebody is suffering from alcoholism or drug addiction in the family, children are, uh, children are to be taken care of in that they cannot be put aside. They have to be involved in the counseling process to begin with. So they know that it is a disease and it is not a defect of character. So they are open up to the other peers in the school. They open up with the friends. They invite their friends to their family because they stop inviting their friends when there is an addicted family member because they feel shame about it. In between filming our documentary, conducting interviews, and spending time with the girls in our village, we had an opportunity to attend various youth conferences and summits where we addressed audiences of 300 to 4,000 youth. Every time we saw young people with the passion to create change in their country, and many who were already doing so. That Pakistan is a country that needs improvement, but there's a lot of people like yourselves who are working to improve Pakistan as well. As activists and journalists, it is always our goal to show the subjects of our work in the most authentic way possible. This documentary is meant to show our Pakistan, one with so much history and culture, and one which can be improved greatly through education, and especially girls' education. To gain a perspective on the status of girls' education in rural areas, including the barriers they face, and find out what kind of work is being done to uplift them, we interviewed Ali Tareen. He is a Pakistani businessman, politician, and social entrepreneur. He helps run the Tareen Education Foundation, which has brought significant changes to the education system of the South Punjab region and given more girls opportunities to go to school. We adopted all the government schools around our area, so there were 86, and we adopted all of them. Because we can't just make one or two good schools, you either do it in all the schools or none of the schools. So we adopted all of the schools. Perfect. And that's when we started realizing uh, the need and demand for high quality education. So we made a school for about uh, 600 kids, um, and we, it was a boys' school, um, and we called it Fez and Fez Boys' School. But we were building it, and when we were just about to start, and we were getting um, enrollments, there was a delegation of about 50 parents 
these are hardcore villagers, big twirly moustaches, yeah. dhotis, big puggies. Yeah. And they come to the office and we are now petrified. We're like, what have we done wrong? Obviously, very sensitive situation you know, with, with schools and kids in the area. They're very, very angry. Yeah. And they say, we are not going to leave this office until you give our girls admission into this school. Yeah. Like, guys, this is a boys' school. It's a huge brass letter that says, fair, fair, boys' school. Yeah. So how can we make it a co-ed school? Because we don't know, we don't care uh, if, if it's co-ed school or not. But how can our sons go and our daughters not go to the school? Mm-hmm. And I asked them, you know, why aren't your daughters currently in school? And the guy looks at me, he goes, because the, only, the current school that was there, there's one shady headmaster who I don't trust. Why would I send my daughter every day to him? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I said, so it's just a lack of female teachers, which is the issue, not because... Do you want to educate them? He's looking at me like I'm, uh, you know, a uh, moron. And I, and I felt like one at the time. Yeah. Because I assume, like everyone uh, in Pakistan assumes, especially in cities, that people in the villages don't want to educate their daughters and that's why the uh, most of the out-of-school children are girls. And it's not that. Because of their pressure, we were bullied by the local community to make uh, our school a co-ed school. Which people think would be crazy in villages. Mm-hmm. So uh, we had to uh, enroll 300 girls into that school immediately. What were some of the other barriers you saw that girls faced when going to school? So one big one was uh, around ID. Okay. When girls get to um, a certain age and obviously the body going through changes, this is not something that their parents or the community talks about. Uh, they're not educated about it themselves. So what happens is as soon as they start having the first period, they stop going to school because they don't want to be in the situation where they need to go to the washroom and they don't have the facilities because again, there's generally no ex- uh, separate bathroom for girls in these schools, especially government schools. And that is one of the main reasons girls drop out. So they stop going for a few months and they stop going. So then we start a program where the couple of years before, our female teachers start having sessions with all the girls in all of our schools. They know this is going to happen, it's totally normal, it's totally natural, your body will go through changes. These are best practices, don't use dirty rags, use this, use that. And uh, we've seen it as we've had a really, it's had a really good impact. Uh, so we've reduced the kind of number of dropouts that have happened uh, during that time and for that reason. What do you hope that the children you are supporting through your work will learn when they go to school? My main goal is to make them as confident as possible and to dream as big as possible. Uh, generally in Pakistan you see, especially with girls, that they know from day one my, the highlight of my life is when I get married and if I want to work after I get married I can be a nurse or I can be a school teacher. Generally in South Punjab these are the two or you can be a seamstress. These are the three accepted professions. So we do a lot of stuff where we get girls from universities all over Pakistan like Lums in Lahore and they go there and they give presentations on alternative career paths. Uh, so someone was in the uh, in the in the in the army, and she went to give a presentation. We got some girls who are professional cricketers. They went to give a presentation, and uh, that's when girls realize that there's so much more in the in the world that I can do uh, than what you know my aunts and uh, cousins and you know uh, neighbors do. We need our women to be with us side by side uh, in in the effort to make Pakistan a more developed country. We cannot do it without them. We cannot, we cannot do it thinking that once we do well, then we'll think about how we can help our girls. It has to be a, a collective effort. And the only way is if they're right next to us, side by side, not below us slightly, right next to us, hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder, pushing Pakistan forward. Access to education is a problem which has two main parts. Getting children access to school is obviously one of them. And it is important to ensure that children are going to school, making use of their resources in their own communities, and progressing into different fields of work following that education. The second part of this issue is ensuring that the children are reaping the maximum benefits of that education and ensuring that it is of high quality. The current system has a cu- curriculum in government schools without actual work being put in to update the education with that of the rest of the world. That is why educational reform is needed. We found out about a new solution to the quality education problem which sticks to Pakistan's roots. It is the inclusion of the ideology and principles of Pakistan's founding fathers in schools. We spoke about potential curriculum changes and the status of education currently with Mia Yusuf Salahuddin. He is a Pakistani socialite 
philanthropist, and ex-politician from Lahore. He is the grandson of one of Pakistan's founding fathers, Allama Iqbal, and currently does a lot of work to revive the culture and promote the talent of Pakistan through various events and television programs. What are some key ideas of Allama Iqbal that Pakistani youth can adopt in their lives so that they can have a positive impact on the country? Sir, so basically, obviously, what does Iqbal teach you? Iqbal teaches you to, to, to be a, a, you know, a, 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 a grow up into a human being with good values. Okay. And um, uh, uh, he, Iqbal believes in the individual. If yeah. you have an individual who is, a, you know, a, a person to be looked up to, okay, of course, his family will be like him. Then the family changes into community, okay? So basically, I think for, for us is to teach our is to, to teach our children good values and to create that society. So what kind of impact do you think can be had if we educate Pakistani girls? Of course, I think that, um, um, for instance, like me, I, my daughter, was, I, I, you know, went to the same school as my as my as my, uh, my 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 boy. Mm -hmm. She went to the same school. She went to educate herself in uh, in America. Okay. In fact, she did a master's. The boys only did their, their bachelor's. Okay. So I think it's very, very important, and this was also the vision of our founding fathers, that girls, you know, they 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 are very much equal to uh, to men. And today, when we see, um, uh, uh, when we look around, we find that girls, mashallah, are, are far more intelligent and getting far better grades than the boys. Do you believe that the ideas and values on which Pakistan was built by leaders like Qaeda Azam and Allah Myself still exist today? And if not, how can we revive them? Well, we need to revive it. I mean, you know, we need to really revive it. We need to, you know, we need to, first of all, what we need to do is we have to very deeply look into our syllabus. Okay? Mm -hmm. And we must understand that what we are going to teach our children. Yeah. Because havoc has been played. Everybody who came decided to write their own history. Mm -hmm. And um, this is very sad. It normally doesn't happen in other countries. Yeah. And uh, um, every political leader which came, they said that they, you know, they misused history and they took it to their advantage. Yeah. So we need to really see that what needs to be taught. I think the, one of the most important books that need to be taught is the reconstruction of Islam, uh, the reconstruction of religious thought in Islam by Iqbal. And I feel very strongly that every graduate in this country, by the time he graduates, he or she graduates. Definitely, this book should be somewhere in the yeah. Yeah. That's a game. Okay. 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 हमारे दिल में कि हम कोई ऐसी चीज छोड़ के जाएं इधर कि हमारी निशानी रहे आपके साथ और आप हमें बाद में भी याद करो जब भी हम वापस तो आएंगे लेकिन पता नहीं कितने सालों के बाद है ना तो हमने ये ब्रेसलेट्स हैं ये इनके इसके इस डब्बे के अंदर रंग बिरंगे मोती भी हैं धागे भी हैं रंग बिरंगे आप सारों को ना मौका मिलेगा कि आप एक ब्रेसलेट बनाओ और आप अपने साथ रखो When thinking about how school can change someone's life, we picture the lessons one learns, but also the changes that school can bring to a person as a whole. Confidence and the ability to dream bigger are both examples of positive changes that can come from quality education. However, to ensure that schools are developing their students into confident, well-rounded citizens, the addition of physical activity and sports is necessary. In 2013, the Foundation for Global Sports Development released an article titled Benefits of School-Based Sports. It states that girls who compete in sports get better grades, graduate at higher rates, and have more confidence. To find out about sports in Pakistani schools and the experience of a professional athlete when studying in the Pakistani school system, we spoke with Noreen Shams. She is a Pakistani sports person who has been a cyclist, a cricketer, and currently is a squash player. 
She has addressed the UN Commission on the Status of Women in 2017 on women's economic empowerment and raises awareness about social issues on social media. What are the challenges that you think, the biggest challenges girls are facing um, and what prevents them from going to school? Like barriers to their education basically. Um, to be honest, to be honest, I feel like the accessibility to school and especially the culture that has been mixed up with religion mm -hmm. is something that is very, very wrong in our country. I mean, uh, we have seen um, Islam in so many other countries progressing so well, just like Malaysia. Yeah. Uh, the culture over here is different. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, I mean, in the many parts of Pakistan, the culture is that women cannot go to school. But this is not in Islam. Yeah. I mean, in Islam, education is for both the genders, or yeah. all the genders. Yeah. But uh, culture over here. So, I mean, I believe that the culture that has been diverted or inverted by the people is wrong. And, I mean, the teachings, I believe, is, I mean, that's one of the biggest obstacles. People don't have vision. And they don't have, I mean, the kind of, you can say, the, I mean, education themselves that how education can change their life. Mm -hmm. They have mixed up westernization and modernization, okay. which is like they think that their culture will be killed or something like that. Yeah. So this is the kind of fear that is a very big obstacle, not only for girls, there are guys as well. Yeah. They cannot go to school. Mm -hmm. So... When, when did you first realize that lack of access to an education was like a major issue in Pakistan? Was it when you were going to school? What, like when was it? Yeah, so in, to, in, I mean, my basic education was worried, but just because of my father. But yeah. when my father died uh, and uh, there was a war going on in there and then it's about, uh, I realized when my schools were closed and I had to go to a government school okay. for a while. And then I... I got to know the difference between the level of education that I was getting and then when I went to Peshawar from the year and then I could see the huge difference between the two schools and the kind of education that was uh, given. So I mean I was privileged enough I would say I went to Peshawar but many of my family members, girls and um, all the guys and many girls from my village I actually felt that what I have been given right now they're not that privileged to get that. Mm. So yeah, the accessibility. Uh, you're a squash player and an athlete yourself, um, but uh, like I just want you to touch on sports in school. So giving those opportunities for girls to you know, become athletes and like get inspired to do those types of things in school is that there in government schools, for example? First of all, I mean, there's a bit of it. Okay. And to be honest, uh, not only in government school, uh, the ra ratio of becoming an athlete, a professional athlete in Pakistan, uh, even if you're a privileged kid or something, uh, it's one ratio thousand. Oh, wow. I mean, I would say, I'm not saying this thing, just bragging about it, that I'm a professional athlete and stuff like that, but I would say this thing out of the thousand seniors or juniors I have had, I'm the only professional athlete that mm -hmm my city or my, my, my region has seen and that's a very big risk. So it's not only the government school which doesn't have this kind of facility for girls or something or for boys as well, it's a privileged school as well. The concept of Pakistan being destined to soar is based off of the idea that Pakistan will improve in the future and the girls in our village are representative of all girls in Pakistan who, when they're educated, will help it prosper and soar as a nation. So we asked some of our interview subjects what their vision for the future of Pakistan looks like. Here's what they said. I, I felt really happy meeting you guys. Like, and I'm feeling happy talking and listening to you guys even more than I'm listening to myself. Because I think, I think, that, I think that the way that you guys are driven, you've probably come all the way from Canada yeah. and you're on a mission, right? And see the change that you guys uh, make. Uh, similarly, I would love to see a lot more girls and women doing practical things in a positive manner to bring about that change. I came to realize that men and women are equal to each other. Although they are different in certain ways, but they are equal in respect, they are equal in rights. So that is when I started my career, there was a lot of change in my mind and I created opportunities 
for girls to work in my organization, which were very good opportunities because we designed it very well that the women in Pakistan could work in our organizations with confidence and with progress in mind without any fear against men. So we designed a program which came out to be very successful in 10-15 years. We had to work very hard because the society is such men have a mentality to dominate women at home and in the society as well. I am a strong believer that women should be given equal opportunities in the family and in the society. It is the duty of every father to make sure not to discriminate between boys and girls. Yeah. And that gives you a lot more player than if you think that boys are only assets and girls are just a sport of work. What you need to do right now, immediately, is remove the sense of inferiority between the, between the two classes. If, any, if, if there's someone in, in a poor village in South Punjab or a rural scene anywhere with an underdeveloped region, that person should not think they are inferior to the well-educated person in in the main city. They should think, if I have that education and I will get that, if I get something of that sort, if I put my extra effort, I can do anything. Yeah. We need to get, we need to have equality in terms of our mindset, yeah. and that's what we need to. Uh, that's what we need to push immediately. Uh, in, in, in every society, in every culture, every province, every city, every village, that everyone is the same, there's no difference between us. Mm-hmm. Some people have better access to education, some people have easier opportunities, yeah. that's it. Look, we have, we are an amazing country. Yeah. We have so many natural resources in this country. Yeah. We have an amazing, you know, a, a pop- population which is almost, almost how many percent, I think over 60 percent, is our youth. We just need proper leadership. Unfortunately, our youth has never been, you know, there's been nobody to guide them and there's been nobody to lead them, okay? And whatever these children have achieved, it is on their own, okay? So I think if we have an environment in this country where we we actually depend on our youth, okay, um, I think that we will go places. Pakistan is a developing country with hundreds of years of history and more than 70 years of independence. In this time, there have been incredible leaders with great dreams about the future of the country, including Alama Iqbal and Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Muhammad Ali Jinnah once said, With faith, discipline, and selfless devotion to duty, there is nothing worthwhile that you cannot achieve. Jinnah's words are exemplified in the youth of Pakistan who are working hard to ensure that the future of the country will be bright. We traveled to several different parts of the country, from South Punjab to Kashmir. Our journey has taught us a lot. We've met many people, seen incredible places, and heard fascinating stories. The problem is huge and requires considerable effort before being resolved. But if there's one thing we've learned, it's that we can't change everything, but that shouldn't stop us from doing something to incite some sort of change. We saw examples of people doing their something, from everyone contributing to the Learning Hub, to the celebrities we interviewed, to Safia who was sending her daughters to school against all odds, and every little girl in Pakistan studying hard in school. With the collective force of the actions everyone is taking, girls, and all children in fact, are destined to soar. Let the story serve as an example to all, to not let the magnitude of issues prevent you from doing your part. Indeed, we can't change everything, but that shouldn't stop us from doing something.
Pakistan.